Good morning, church. Today is Mother's Day. But it is the day that the Lord has made, so we will rejoice and do what? Be glad in it. it. Stand with us this morning. We're going to start out with worship. Let's go and do it. We're here to give him worship. So let's do that today. Listen. Is it enough? To gather in this place Is it enough To lift our hands and pray Is it enough To offer us the heart of me You want it all My spirit, mind, and heart Lift it up I can Yeah. 
Benedict, if you would please. What a wonderful day as we celebrate our Heavenly Father. One of the great things about being the family of God and celebrating our Heavenly Father is celebrating the accomplishments of those who are in the body of Christ. And we believe in the family of God, and we are so grateful for all the wonderful things. A lot happening right now, and a lot of graduations. Now, normally, when it comes to the high school graduates, we let Pastor Mike do this. Pastor Mike is not feeling well this morning, so pray for him. So I'm going to be picking up the gauntlet on this. So as we get underway, I need the following specimens to come up and stand to my right, preferably in the order I'm about to speak them. I need Alexis Bond. I need Ryan Coffey, I need Abby Jordan, I need Drew Landau, and I need Trude Oberhauser. And these are our high school graduates for this year. And so, well done one and all now let me run through the wonderful things these people have accomplished we're going to start with alexis bond <laughs> academics graduating from father mcgivney with a 3.8 gpa member of the national honor society of high school scholars it's four years um, in basketball all conference and the captain for two of those years three years softball all conference and captain for all three years Working here at Calvary, serving in kids camp and many of our kids events, We're serving in our choir, um, youth mission trips to Colorado and to Louisville, and in her future plan, she is going to be heading to Olivet College in Michigan where she will be studying business and playing softball. So let's hear it for Alexis. So we have this for you. And by the way, if in any of those books you open it up and there's a different name, meet people. Um, <laughs> All right, second of which, we have Ryan Coffey. Ryan Coffey, uh, graduating from Edwardsville with a 4.4 GPA. Silver Medallion Award, that's the top 8% of his class. National Honor Society, English National Honor Society, slacker. Um, <laughs> he volunteered at the library and at Restored Decor. He worked at Target for two years, by far my favorite cashier. Um, and, in the, and here at Calvary in the preschool Bible study. And so we are grateful for you. His future plans include heading to the University of Missouri to study computer science. So job well done, sir. Thank you very much. Abby Jordan. Abby Jordan is graduating from Edwardsville with a 3.5 GPA and is in the National Honor Society. Her activities include being the vice president of both the Black Student Union and Filmmakers Club, members of the ASL Club and the Key Club. Uh, she gets to volunteer and help some very special students, uh, works in a very great way, and we are so grateful for her and for her spirit here at Calvary. She served in our Awana um, as a student leader in kids camp, in preschool Bible study, in choir, in youth mission trips to both Colorado and Louisville. And her future plan, she's going to start at St. Louis Community College and then transfer to Wash U or Webster University with a goal of becoming a film director. So you can remember. <laughs> you knew her when, you can name drop later. All right. Drew Landau, graduating from Edwardsville with a 3.7 GPA in the National Honor Society. Activities and service, four-year varsity wrestler, sixth at state as a junior, top eight senior year. Doing that with a bad shoulder, by the way, which is amazing. Um, Two-time captain, most valuable wrestler as a senior, active in the FCA, and worked in our kids' camp here at Calvary. And so grateful for him. And his future plans include University of Central Missouri to study nursing and to wrestle. And so, outstanding work, sir. Congratulations. By the way, catch everybody up here. All right. Um, and then Trude Oberhauser. Trude Oberhauser is graduating from Metro East Lutheran and the Oberhauser Academy. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, honor roll. And his activities include Scholar Bowl, regional champs. FCA, Huddle Leader, Edwardsville Ultimate Frisbee Team, and Tennis Team each for one year. Football Team for two years, All Division. 
And here at Calvary, served in various kids' events and activities. Uh, youth mission trip to Louisville was a part of that, and that's exciting. He is going to be heading to SIUE to study mechanical engineering. And so, excellent work, sir. Congratulations. We are so proud of all of you, and as we recognize your future in the Lord, you don't really find out who you are until you leave. And what I mean by that is coming to church, being here, your parents bringing you to church, you're going to find out over the next two years who you are in your personal life and your personal integrity and your personal relationship with Jesus. So we're praying for you. We're praying for you in a world that is very difficult to get out into. A lot of people are going to be telling you a lot of things, a lot of influences, a lot of temptations. But, and I mean this, we believe in every one of you. You are amazing and you have done amazing things here. And we believe that as you go, that the power of Jesus Christ in you is here. Your parents have installed it in you. Your brothers, sisters, family have installed it in you. We believe in you and we are here for you always. God bless you and we mean that from the depths of our heart. Let's hear it for him one more time. Well done. Y'all can find your way back to your seats. And congratulations to you, one and all job. Very, very well done. By the way, I always do this because I, I, I'm working on Mr. Brockmeyer's notes. Um, do we have any other graduates that I missed? Nah, they're not going to put their hand up, guaranteed. But anyway, all right. I have two more graduates. We're going to switch gears to our collegiate graduates now. And so I need Tessa and Steve. Come on forward. All right. These two fine people have amazing things happening in their lives, and we are grateful for them, and these are our collegiate slash university graduates and a whole lot more. Tessa and Steve, Tessa, we're going to start with you, who has just completed a bachelor's in social work at SIUE. We are so proud of you, and we are so proud of the family that y'all are starting. So excited for y'all. She serves so wonderfully in working with our children down in Iwana and doing so many other things in our church. We are so grateful for you, and you bless our hearts again and again. God bless you in the places where you go. We dearly wish we could keep them, but we're thinking that relocation is in their future. But we're going to be praying for you every step of the way, and who knows, maybe in the long scheme, God will bring you back here. But you have blessed us again and again. We are so grateful. Steve, God bless you, man. Steve was just commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Army. Hey, uh hey. -huh. And on top of it, earned a bachelor's in biology also from SIUE. So God bless y'all. Amazing. So we've gotten you a little something here just as our way of saying thank you to you for you, Tess. And by the way, these you can share with each other. I think you might. And Steve, for you, kind of building your household Bible library. And some things just to encourage you and let you know how much we love you and appreciate you both. We have, again, been so mightily blessed by you and are grateful for you. And we're just looking forward to the amazing things you do everywhere you go and everything you do. May God bless you and may God bless your family. Let's hear it for them one more time. Okay, y'all can head on. Did I miss anybody else in the way of collegiate graduates? Okay, we are grateful for you. One more thing here today, and that is... This being Mother's Day, we are taking up a offering. We do so, and here in the state of Illinois, we have the Baptist Home and Children's Services, children, family, Baptist Home, Family and Children's Services. That's close enough. And we take up an offering for them every year. They help in caring for so many in need. They've helped many of our own in adoption. It's a wonderful agency, and we are grateful for them as one of our arms of Southern Baptist work here in the state of Illinois. We have envelopes that are here if you're giving cash and you need to designate that. If you're writing a check, you don't need to do that. Just drop it in the offering box as you're heading out there, and it's something that we'll receive. If you didn't come today and you weren't prepared for it and you want to give it next week, that's fine. But we want it to be something that we can do in blessing them as they bless bless those, uh, many of whom are needing a great helping hand in what they do. So we are grateful for them and for their continued ministry. Now, we're going to switch gears. Beth, we are grateful for you. If you will come on up at this time and share with us, and she has a word to encourage you with this Mother's Day. Is this working? Oh, okay. Hi. Um, I'm Beth Tossi. I'm going to read a poem for uh, Mother's Day. Um, it's called The Mother's Love. There's no love like a mother's. Her heart is filled with care. With Christ as her example, her Savior's love she'll share. 
A mother's love is endless, not changing for all time. When needed for by her children, a mother's love will shine. God bless these special mothers. God bless them, everyone, for all their tears and heartaches, a special work they've done. When days on earth are over, a mother's love lives on. Through many generations, God blessing, God blessings on each one. Be thankful for our mothers. We love with a higher love from power God has given and strength from up above. Uh, thank you for mothers, or thank you moms. <laughs> um, your like honor and like dedication, hard work to uh, everybody is very admirable. Happy Mother's Day. Beth, thank you so very much. Well, happy Mother's Day to you all. And as we take ourselves back into worship now, um, we're going to think about all that God has done for us and what it means to be the family of God and doing the work of the family of God. And we are grateful for all of you. May God bless you in the places where you go and the works that you do. Let's join together in prayer. Father, we are grateful for this morning and grateful for this, our pleasure, to come into your house to worship you. Father, sing praises to your name and just to lift up the name of Jesus that binds our hearts and our lives together. We think about family today and we think about what we've accomplished in our families. We think about mothers and all that they do for us. And we think about the blessing of you as our Heavenly Father. We bring it all together and we realize that we have been loved. Whoever we are in this life, we have been loved. Lord, I pray that we would be ambassadors of the love that you have demonstrated to us in your son, Jesus Christ, in all the places in life where we go, in all the works that we do, all to your glory and all to your praise. Father, as we praise you now, we pray that your spirit would lift ours to show us the word of truth, that we would walk within it and to give to you the full measure of praise due to your holy name. Bless you and praise you, and we thank you for this all. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, let's stand to our feet. It's time to worship. And it is indeed time to worship once again. And uh, I'll just say this: there's a there's a powerful thing in prayer, and uh, there was no one who was more of a prayer warrior than my mother. And I know that. I know that's true for many of you ladies out there, when you're especially when you're praying for your children. But uh, we're going to spend some time thinking about that, and we're going to introduce a new song to you here in just a moment. But uh, we want to just lift up this these words of what a friend we have in Jesus. So just lift it up and sing with us. Yeah. 
God bless you, praise team. We thank you so much for sharing with us. We'll stay on our feet as we honor God's word together. Make your way to the book of Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, as we consider God's word to us. And yes, I know I put Genesis on the wall. That's wrong, my fault. Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through verse 10. Now, man... From the house of Levi, went and took as a wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. While her young women walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this passage and for the encouragement it gives to our hearts. We are grateful for mothers, and we are grateful for the work of everyone who attends to family. Father, the work of raising up the next generation. We realize biblically that there is a difference between raising children and raising them up to you. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that we would understand the high calling of parenting and that we would recognize as children that, Father, we have been given a great legacy that has been bestowed upon us. Whatever our earthly parentage is, that you as our Heavenly Father are calling us upward to greatness in Jesus Christ. And Father, we will never receive our, our full potential or pursue anything in this life that is worthy of anything worthwhile unless it is through Christ and by the calling of Christ in our lives. Speak to us this morning by your boundless grace and wisdom, praising you for what you are about to do. This is our prayer, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Be seated. Being a mother is an amazing thing. 
One mother was walking out the back door to pull some weeds in the backyard. She noticed her four children and two of their friends, and they were gathered. This is always a sign that something's going on. They were standing in a circle in a very tight huddle. And that immediately got her attention, so she walked over to find out what they were doing. And there on the ground, right in the middle of the huddle, was a mother skunk and her, four, and her five babies. And she screamed and she said, children, run. Each one of the children reached down, grabbed one skunk, and ran. <laughs> I'm sure bath time was interesting that night. This is what you do. You never know where it's going to take you. You never, what's going to, never know what's going to happen. Folks, it's never boring, is it? But it's the greatest delight of our lives. And we are grateful for the honor and pleasure of what we do with our kids and what they mean to us. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever's going on, God bless you. I wish you a wonderful day. And even if you don't have any family in this world, know that you're a part of our family, part of the family of God. And knowing that we all have a Heavenly Father in common, we've all received a common adoption as sons and daughters of God. And that means that we're all a part of something and take great comfort and great power in that wherever you are. Thank God for mothers and how God uses them to build God's next generation. I want to take a moment and share with you four points out of Exodus chapter 2, the first 10 verses. We're actually going to draw from, pun intended, um, Exodus chapter 1 a little bit with this. And so I encourage you to read both chapters when you get a little time today when you're not celebrating with your family in the places where you go. But the first truth I'm going to share with you this morning, trust those you love most to God's will. Trust those you love most to God's will. When we hear the description of the vessel of Jochebed, and if you're wondering who Jochebed is, that's uh, Moses' mother. We'll get to that in a bit. She made for her son Moses in verse 3. It's literally a miniature Noah's Ark. Okay, you got to get your head wrapped around that to get what happens next. Genesis 6, 14, what does God say to Noah? It says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark. Oh, there was one room in this ark, by the way. Um, and cover it inside and out with pitch. Jochebed made her own ark, and what did she put inside of it? What she loved and cared for most. Exodus chapter 2, verse 3, she could hide him no longer. She took for him a basket, made a bulrush, just daubed it on the outside, we're going to say with pitch. Put the child in it, placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. The ark, it's a vessel of salvation for any who trust God. And you have to put your trust in to that and sustain it. Noah did it, here's Jochebed, and she's doing it. For Jochebed, the ark is her means of trusting God with her son Moses. It's a lot of trust. After all, no three-month-old could pilot a boat in this kind of floating vessel in the bulrushes. Folks, it could float, but it couldn't be steered. Not that, Noah could, or not that Moses could do it anyway. The waters just take it where they will. Jochebed put her son into the Nile upriver from Pharaoh's daughter. But here's the thing. It's kind of a lot like life. Once you put something in the water, there's really no telling where the water is going to take it. And when you step out the door every morning and you head out into life, you have no idea where it's going to take you either. It applies to you. It applies to your kids. We just see what winds up happening. One of the most agonizing seasons in life, especially in parenting, is when you send your kids off to places where you can't watch them, where you can't be with them. Send them off to stay at a friend's for the first time. Then you send them off to camp. You send them off with friends. Then you send them off on a date. You send them off to prom. You send them off to college. You send them off. You send them off. You send them off. Whew. And you worry a little. You worry a lot, if we're honest with one another. But you wind up learning how to trust God and the training that you've invested in them. Jochebed, at this point, can only sit back and wait for Moses' sister to report what happened. By the way, we're thinking this Moses' sister was probably Miriam, unless he had another sister we don't hear about in Scripture. point is, sometimes God challenges our control over what we love most. You know why? Because God wants you to put him in the driver's seat. Some of y'all are really great at worrying, but you're not as good at trusting and God will keep putting you in situations where he tells you, you need to know that I have this. Do your best and let me take this from there. At times, you may not like what he's doing. You may not prefer the way he's doing it. But can I share with you a secret? He's been doing it a long, long time and he's better at it than you are. So I would trust him because he knows what's best. Moses spoiler alert, was going to be just fine. You're going to discover 
that God works out good ends for those that he loves. And he's able to do amazing things. The question is, do we trust God? And do we trust the training in faith and wisdom that we have invested in the ones that we love? Which is why one of the big things that we do here in our church is that investment in the next generation. What do we do with our children? What do we do with our youth? And what do we do in equipping families with the means of being able to bless children? Folks, hear me on this. There's a huge difference in the goal of parenting being getting your kids to come to church with you and getting your kids to fall in love and walk with Jesus. Not even the same thing. And the reason you find the difference is a bit of the charge of what I gave to our graduates a little while ago is that you find out who you are when you're at home and mom and dad have that restriction over you and they can push you and lead you. But when you're out on your own and you're making your own decisions, I remember when I was at college and here I am, I'm called into ministry. I'm going to a Baptist college. I'm surrounded by other Christians. I rolled around and I remember I'd been at school for probably about a month or so. I got up and I did what some of y'all have been dealt with before. For the first time in my life, I realized I got up Sunday morning and said, I could blow off church today. It would have been the first time in my life that I even had that option. Wrestled with it for about five minutes. Happily, I made the right choice. But you know why? Because my parents had conditioned me all the way through that this is non-negotiable. If you're not sick, you're here because this is where God's going to speak to me. Now, folks, that's just one spiritual decision among countless others that ramp upward as we set our priorities before the Lord. And it comes in the fact of whether we're trusting God with what we love most and whether that carries with us in the places where life's going to take us. Point number two this morning. Rejoice in God's agents of mercy for your children. Rejoice in God's agents of mercy for your children. In case you're wondering why Moses' mother put him in a basket and stuck him in the Nile. Well we realized that there was a lot that was going on in Exodus chapter 1 that was consumed with the mistreatment of the Israelites. The Israelites started off when they came in under Joseph, and they were very well treated because they recognized that Joseph had done so much for the nation of Israel, but there arose a Pharaoh who did not know him. And in such, he did not respect the gods of his, of his, his God or any of that. So what wound up happening was they decided that the number of the Hebrews was growing and growing. We need to keep these people under control. We will make them slaves. We will cruelly treat them. And as they still continued to multiply, Pharaoh eventually decides that now I'm going to kill all of the sons of the Hebrew women. That will decimate their ability to reproduce, and it will lower them. By the way, it didn't work, okay? It's interesting. Jochebed puts her beloved son into the Nile. What did she expect? to happen next. It's interesting, Exodus 2 verse 4, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Because the Egyptians are often depicted in scripture as the bad guys, especially when you consider the battle of wills that's going to soon come to bear between Moses and between the Pharaoh who knew not Joseph and mistreated God's people. The midwives who were commanded by Pharaoh that you will kill every son born to a Hebrew woman. Instead, they side with the Hebrews and they spare the newborn. So Pharaoh commands that the Hebrew sons then be cast into the Nile because he couldn't trust the midwives anymore. Pharaoh's daughter finds a Hebrew boy floating in the Nile and she's there bathing and what does she come across? She shows unexpected mercy, even acting against her own father's orders. There's no reason to expect mercy of an Egyptian toward a Hebrew in this framework, except God had hold of her heart. She's not someone you would expect to show mercy, but it didn't restrict God from being able to move in her heart and do something amazing. Now, now I want you to think about this for a minute. Have you ever thought about all the unexpected acts of mercy that are scattered throughout Scripture? The Israelites showed remarkable mercy toward Rahab and her family when they took Jericho, even though they were enemies that were cursed by God. Nebuchadnezzar showed remarkable kindness toward Daniel and his friends. Artaxerxes showed remarkable favor toward Nehemiah. And King Ahasuerus was very good to Esther and to her people. Don't underestimate God's ability to put people in your path or in your children's path 
to help them when they need it most. You know why? They're tools in God's toolbox. And sometimes we think that God is restricted in his reach only to the things that are Christians, only to the things that are godly. Folks, God is the God of the universe. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And he can claim the hearts and lives of individuals, steer them where he wills them to go because he is sovereign God and he is amazing what he can do. And at times, some of the harsher personalities that we encounter are actually the ones that are working for God's good in us, even if they themselves are not good people. I mean, you think about it. Jacob, in the book of Genesis, his uncle Laban was one of the most contrary individuals in Scripture, but so was Jacob. How do you take a contrary person and how do you change them by putting them under somebody even more contrary than they are? So you finally see yourself in the mirror and you finally grow up and change. Jacob matured most during the years that he spent with his uncle Laban trying to get. He wanted one wife, wound up with two. Do what you will with that. We talk a lot about guardian angels. Don't overlook the guardian personalities or coaches that God places in your life. Rejoice for their work and for what God does with them. Number three this morning. Give what you love most to God and then receive his blessings. Give what you love most to God and receive his blessings. This chapter, we don't get the name of Moses' mother. We got to fast forward a little bit in scripture to Exodus chapter 6, verse 20. And we get her name, Jochebed. It tells us in Exodus chapter 6, verse 20, Amram took as, took as his wife, Jochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him, Aaron, and Moses, her name means Yahweh is glory. That's interesting. Always pay attention to the names in the Bible. And it was one thing for circumstances to take Moses. It was another thing for Jochebed to give him. Committing your child, committing your future, committing the things that you love most into the Lord's hands will be one of the hardest things and yet one of the most important things you will ever do spiritually because it will be the source of your greatest blessings. In an emotional ordeal, Jochebed commits her son Moses to the water, and she experiences astonishing blessings. And I need you to get your head around this, because four things happen that are absolutely mind-staggering in the irony of what God accomplishes here that went against what anybody would have ever thought would have happened. Number one, her son remains alive and well when he should certainly have died. Pharaoh's order, this Hebrew, Hebrew male should have been cast into the Nile. Literally, should have taken the basket, tipped it upside down. That was the end of the story. Tragic, horrible. We would grieve over that. But that was what was happening all over, but not in this case. Number two, Pharaoh's daughter took mercy on the child and saved him. We weren't expecting that either. Who knew that this Egyptian would have had a kind heart and God would have given her a compassion for this child? Number three. When Moses' sister pops out of the bushes and asks, can I retrieve a Hebrew to nurse the boy? Circumstances, can we put circumstances in air quotes? Okay, circumstances wind up that Moses' own mother gets to mother him. And she gets paid for it. Mothers ought to get paid. We can't afford to, but mothers ought to get paid. Seriously, okay? And though Egypt serves as Israel's cruel taskmasters and slave drivers, God works out conditions where a Hebrew child, get your head around this, is given royal Egyptian education in a pool of young men that are groomed to potentially replace even Pharaoh himself. See, we always want to think, we think of kings and we think it's their biological children that are the ones that will succeed them to the throne. But it was the, it was the habit of cultures like these. That wasn't necessarily the case. What they did instead was they would pool a group of people they considered to be the best of the best. They would educate them at the highest level that they could. And then when Pharaoh decided, this is the one that I want to follow after me, and that would become the heir apparent. Different set of circumstances, Moses could literally have become Pharaoh in spite of being a Hebrew. But more importantly, he gets an education that enables him to know how to lead people. He was just going to lead a different people for the purposes of God. This might not have been the optimal life for her son. But under these conditions at this time, in this situation, these elements constituted blessings beyond anything that Jochebed could ever have imagined. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. 
It begins by giving who or what you love most to the Lord, realizing that it was already His. Everything in life that you're fighting God for control of, it was never yours to begin with. It was God's, and that includes your children. The first thing that you recognize as a godly parent when you look to Scripture is that my, parent, or that my children don't belong to me, they belong to God. They wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the blessing of God, and they belong to him. Step one. Step two, the greatest lesson in parenting isn't your love for your child. It's God's ownership over your child. And in realizing that I love, and I love my, I love my child, and I am grateful for him, but I understand something greater, and that is that my child belongs to God, and that is the most important thing. Third, raise your kids as God's kids. Their future should be God's future. And the Heavenly Father's parentage over them is more important than my parentage over them. Raise kingdom kids rather than church kids who make a Jesus difference in their generation. You know why? Because they love the Lord. And that's unfortunately the one thing you can't make your kids get. You can show it to them in your heart and in your life. But the one thing you can't make a kid get that they've got to decide for themselves, we can tell you all about the gospel. We can tell you all about Jesus. We can groom you and all the principles of God's word. But there's got to be a point when you personally say, it's about me and Jesus. It's about he is the Lord of my life and what he wants me to do. And when I commit to that, everything my parents instill within me is now going to blossom. Because something amazing is going to come from it because God became first. Point number four this morning. Never underestimate what a single child can do in the Lord. Never underestimate what a single child can do in the Lord. Okay, so here's Pharaoh's daughter. She's on, she's on the bank, came down to bathe, doing what she's doing. She's got her attendants there with her. Sure enough, what do we find? Hey, here's a baby. We find that's a Hebrew baby. Why show mercy to this child? I'm sure Moses was adorable, okay? Probably in a Winston Churchill kind of way. Um, all babies look like Winston Churchill. Look it up. Anyway, <laughs> somewhere in her mind, I, I, I can literally across time and history hear the dialogue. She looks and she realizes that the commandment of Pharaoh was kill all the Hebrew babies. And here, and she's looking at one, holding one. And she probably said this, he's just one child. What's the harm of letting one child live? Considering Israel's plight as slaves in Egypt at this, at this time in their history, probably no harm at all. Yet, this child, this child's Moses. None of them had any idea what God was going to do with him. You know, you read through the New Testament, you read through the parables of Jesus, and you realize one theme that Jesus was constantly punching was the unbelievable potential in very small things when they belonged to God. We think about the seed as small as a mustard seed, and what it's able to achieve. And then we realize what one little Hebrew baby in the midst of an oppressed people, what could happen in a culture to literally turn an entire nation upside down. And where does it all start? And here is the daughter of Pharaoh holding a baby in her arms saying, what difference could one child make in this reality? But Moses Moses will wind up on the run from Pharaoh. Moses will wind up watching animals for, Pharaoh, for Jethro, his father-in-law. God will call him to be one of the most amazing persons in the Old Testament. And Moses will become so great. He will become the recipient of one of the greatest personal relationships with God in all of Scripture. Read the life of Moses. Read how close he was to God, the way he walked and dwelled and stood before the Lord. And God spoke to him as person to person. Who else in Scripture had that kind of relationship? He will receive the law and he will become the lawgiver to God's people. He will become counterbalance to the most powerful leader on the planet in Pharaoh and will best him without ever having to fight a single military battle. He will be the deliverer through the ten plagues. He will be the liberator of the Israelite slaves. He will be leader over Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. He will be the overseer of the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness. He will be the one who was responsible for the building of the Ark of the Covenant. Literally the touch point of the greatest holiness on planet earth. 
at that time and for hundreds of years thereafter. And he will become worker of more miracles than anybody else in the Old Testament. You might want to argue Elijah on this one, but trust me, he's up there at the top of the list. And you think about that. Just one little baby. Conceiving Moses in from the beginning, Jochebed couldn't have conceived all that God was going to do through her son. Three keys to parenting children toward God's potential. Number one, ascertain what God created them to be. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever do. I am me, I have my likes, I have my drive, I have my personality way of doing things. And I tend to want to believe that my child's going to go in the exact same direction, but our children are individuals, sometimes painfully so. And what's interesting is I've got to realize that God has wired my child. And I know that our, our modern woke culture has taken that concept and taken it in all sorts of goofy, weird directions. But folks, let's get back to the Bible on this and understand that God is going to do some amazing things through our kids. Look to how the God of the Bible uniquely blueprinted your child. For holiness, for service, for doing a work in their generation that is going to transform reality through God and Jesus Christ. And he's placed gifts in them. And they have a marvelous personality and a marvelous calling. And we need to embrace that and we need to encourage that and push them toward the fullness of what God made them to be. Which leads to number two, encourage God's potential in them. It is challenging when your child's wiring is contrary to your own, like you're athletic, they're bookish, or they're into electronics and technology, you're into guns and outdoor and camo, okay? Um, you know, it's interesting, Isaac ran into trouble because he had two boys, couldn't have been more different, Jacob and Esau. And you've got one who's very outdoorsy, and you've got one who's very home and likes to cook and stay by the home and the tent and everything else. What do you do with that? And the problem with that was, he failed in letting his children know, I love you both the same, even though you're different. Favoritism decimates the confidence of a child. Instead, we realize that I love you because of what God has made you to be. Now, what has God made you to be? And now let's encourage that to go forward, to learn the word of God and to walk in spiritual greatness and to see the blessings of God and to pursue the calling of God upon your life and to see where God takes you, which leads to number three, direct all your parenting toward God's purposes. One chief mistake that godly parents can make is that we parent our kids for us. Don't embarrass me. Make me proud. Do things that I can say, this is my son, the doctor. You know, this kind of stuff. And that's not where this goes. We believe if we set high enough standards, if our kids please us, they'll please God. Instead, parent your children to please the Lord, to serve the Lord, to worship the Lord, to lead others to know the Lord and obey the Lord. And folks, these biblical children, they will please us, but most importantly, they're pleasing God. And that should be enough to put a smile on our face if we walk with God. Here's what's interesting. We're not going to hear any more about Jochebed for the rest of Scripture. Once we get to Exodus chapter 6, she literally passes off the page of Scripture. We hear no more about her. But she did an amazing job with her son under unimaginable circumstances. And, and I think about, we look back on those who were the powerful forces in our lives and how God uses them. And it just sounds so trite on Mother's Day to say, thank God for godly moms. But you know something, folks? I can't say it enough. My mom prayed for me all the way through, and I had more than my share of rough patches. She never stopped. And I guarantee of all the forces and all the wonderful people that God has placed in my lives, I am grateful for one and what she did in me. And those of you who are here today, I hope you have a great earthly relationship with your mother. And I hope that you're able to share how much you're grateful to them for what they've instilled within you. But wherever you are, let's understand that the family that I have now and the opportunity that I have been given is to make a difference for Christ through those that I send out literally 
to do the work and the will of God. And we are grateful for the privilege that we are given in our church ministry of helping you to build godly families and for the work that you do. And we are grateful for you and may God bless you and grant to you everything that you require in making that a reality. May the Lord watch over you and help you with that. And may you know how special you are and how much God appreciates you and is grateful for you. Stand with me. Let's pray together. Praise team, come on up, take your places. Father, we are grateful for your blessings toward us. We are grateful for the blessings of mothers. We are grateful for the high calling that we've received in Jesus Christ. And we are grateful for what it is to raise that generation to you, realizing the amazing things that you're able to do through these children, that just one child can change an entire nation. Father, what difference can our children make in this world? We ask, Lord, that you would help us in the works that we do to be pleasing in your sight. We consider our hearts in this time of invitation, realizing it begins with our personal relationship with Jesus. And that is the relationship that by example extends to our children and to everyone else in our lives that we care about. Father, bless us and open our hearts as you speak to us that we would be saved, that we would be baptized, that we would be members and parts, vital parts of your church. Father, in all things, that Jesus Christ would be proclaimed as Lord and King in every household, and the principles of your word would govern what we do and where we go. Thank you for being our God in every circumstances and for the boundless love that you model for us as our Heavenly Father and for the works that you do in this generation to show others how much you love us in Jesus Christ. Thank you for this all. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'll be seated for just a moment. Scott, come on up. Just stand beside me. <laughs> it's all good, brother. We'll get to the rest of it in a minute. Okay. Scott Wilman comes this morning. Y'all know Scott. And Scott's been taking his time and working his way through. He Too realizes, Noel, <laughs> there's been just a couple people praying for him on this. But Scott's come to the point where he realizes, I need to join the church. I need to get baptized. I need to follow through with what Christ wants me to do. And we're going to talk about this. We're going to get him ready, but we're going to be presenting him in the waters of baptism very quickly. And just to get him going forward on this, we're grateful for his heart of faith in Christ and for where he goes as he follows forward in this. All of you who receive him and encourage him in this decision and just, just being there with him every step of the way, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Let's, indeed. Indeed. Brother, God bless you. We'll let you be seated over here. Grateful for you. Folks, it's been a great day to all of our graduates. We are grateful for you. May God bless you, and we wish you well. All of you who are heading out and spending time with family, nothing going on at church here this evening. We're going to give you this time to be with family. Believe that's important. If you're traveling, be safe in the places where you go. We're going to look forward to seeing you soon and soon. God is blessing all over the place, okay? And we want you to be a part of the blessings that God is raining down. May the Lord walk with you and bless you. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to dismiss you in a word of prayer, fellowship with one another as you're heading out the door today. And let's make it a great day for the glory of God. Father, it's good to be in your house. It's good to be with your people. Bless us now, Lord, as we head out from here today to do great works for you. Thank you for the blessing of family. And thank you, Lord, for what it is to be part of the body of Christ. Lord, in the works that we do, may you be pleased with us as we take the message of Jesus Christ and share with others and the testimony of his blessings in our lives. We are grateful for all that you've given to us in him. Thanking you for this all, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.